Hello, and welcome back to Read Back. <laughs> and welcome to the heat dome as well. It's incredibly hot here. It's, I think, literally 105 degrees. So my brain is not all here. Uh, but we're going to talk about what I read this past week. And I was not feeling like reading, that is for sure. But I did get a lot of stuff finished and some good progress on stuff I needed to do, like booktube prize stuff. So let's let's jump right into it. So I think first we'll, we'll start with the physical stuff. Um, I have less to say about this one, but this was Borders by Thomas King and Natasha Donovan uh, is the illustrator. This is a graphic novel. I really like the art style. It's, it's simple but clean, I think. So we are following um, a young character here. So he's the youngest child and then his sister and mother. Um, so mainly from his perspective, this is in present, looking back at his sister having left their reservation, their Blackfoot uh, tribe. And they kind of touch on why she left, um, the strained relationship between her and her mother. But the main focus of this story is that, that he and his mother are about to go visit the sister in Salt Lake City. And in order to do that, they have to cross from the Canadian side of the border into the US side of the border. And when doing that, his mother will not declare her citizenship as Canadian or American. She declares it as Blackfoot. And that creates a pretty big problem for the border control folks. So um, because you can, you can exit a border, but not enter one without without declaring, they get stuck between the two borders. So, so that's an interesting premise. Um, I had wanted to pick this up specifically because I read a children's book earlier this year that mentioned the fact that there are um, tribal reservations that are on both sides of, of the border um, where they, they literally can't traverse their land because of Canadian and US borders. And so this, this kind of touches on that, but even more, it is touching on the disrespect of tribal land, um, the disrespect of tribal citizenship as being distinct from US or Canadian citizenship. Uh, so I thought that was really well done. The, the one thing I didn't like about this is that it was, it was kind of heartbreaking because it seems the mother, because of her strained relationship with her daughter, was almost doing this as a way of delaying um, or not actually making it to see the daughter. Um, it, it felt like she was just being difficult at times and I, I hated having that to kind of trip up the message that this was actually getting at of kind of how ridiculous it was that these these national borders made such a, a difference and were such a blocker for them to get through. But I, I do think this was really well executed and great for kind of starting conversations with the younger reader. This is definitely in more of the YA to maybe even upper middle grade range. Um, I think that there were wonderful characters in this. Um, so we definitely saw some of the sisters backstory. We saw them reach out to someone who worked at a shop um, between the borders who kind of ended up being the, the person that they connected with the most and eventually helped them in finally getting through the borders and back to their home. Um, so, so I think their situation worked out by pure luck and I do wish there had been more exploration of what we can do to make a difference in that permanently because nothing actually changes here as a result of this and I, I don't think anything in, in the real world has actually changed as a result of this that would make it easier for them to declare their citizenship properly. So I wish there had been a little element of that but I do think this was great and appropriate for its age group. So, so really solid read. The next one that I read, losing my books, is uh, Light from Uncommon Stars by Rika Aoki. And this was from my TBR for this month. This is a sci-fi fantasy mix. However, I would say I actually went in with the, totally the wrong <laughs> impression. I thought for some reason this was gonna be like significantly in space. There, there's no space in here. It's pretty much entirely contemporary with some minor speculative elements on both the sci-fi and fantasy side. 
So we're following, I think, three characters here. Um, we're following Lantron, who is an alien who runs a donut shop with her crew, who are also her children, or treated as her children. Uh, we are following Shizuka Satomi, who is a violin teacher, this incredible mentor who has created um, these world famous violinists and is world renowned for that role, but also feared as the queen of hell. Uh, and of course, no one knows that she actually also has a deal with the devil. So she very literally has made a sort of Faustian deal for uh, longevity uh, and kind of infamy in order to trade seven souls to this, this devil. And in doing that, she has mentored these students. She's mentored six students and is now looking for her perfect seventh student. And of course, tying in, we have Katrina Nguyen. And Katrina is a, a trans woman who is a teenager that has run away from her family. And she, because she is trans, she is very limited in her options. Um, that is a major piece of why she's run away. And so she's turned to things like sex work. Um, she is living homeless on a park bench when Shizuka Satomi finds her. And it all sort of culminates together because of that, because on that park bench, uh, Shizuka Satomi has gotten a donut from the alien's donut shop and is feeding it to the ducks in the park when she encounters Katrina Nguyen. And she finds out that Katrina is a violinist and they make this connection, but then she, she goes off on her way and there's no real way of connecting again. So she starts trying to repeat this to get back to this potential violinist. Um, and so through that, Shizuka Satomi starts going back to the donut shop and making a connection with the woman who runs the donut shop, who is unknown to her, an alien. And they have a little, little bit of a relationship. Um, it's, it's very adorable. But what I loved the most about this, I think, is that this story is centering three women who have all been very othered by the world. Um, they are all Asian American, first of all. Katrina is, is trans and clearly is treated as an outsider through the entire book um, to, to an extreme that I think maybe went a little too far. So I, I didn't buy a little bit of the, the misgendering. Um, I'm not at all denying that that happens. However, like there are natural things that, that humans do um, when, when addressing people if they've been given information before. So in all of the cases here, um, Shizuka addresses Katrina with the, the proper pronoun in the face of a person who then misgenders her. And, and that didn't ring true, except in one case where the, a person was overtly vitriolic about it. Um, most of the people were well-intentioned and well-meaning and almost certainly would have used the pronoun that was used initially. And so that didn't make a lot of sense. But I think, I think that was a little heavy handed and could have been, you know, tightened up a bit. But that was a very minor criticism, I think, in here where the, the transness was handled extremely well. I think seeing her dealing with homelessness, seeing her dealing with an abusive family, seeing her dealing with um, being pushed into sex work and why that happened to her was was really powerful because that's not a story that we get a lot, uh, especially in something that's, you know, this is not that hard hitting, like trauma gaze type story. Um, this is much more a, a positive speculative SFF story. And, and I think it was a great portrayal of that. So then we have Shizuka Satoma, Satomi and her whole story is, is where she's been pulled outside. She's been separated for, from her own community of this violin world by this deal that she's made. And so, so as I said, she's very othered by that and is kind of revered and feared at the same time by the community that she's, she's meant to be almost the best of the best within. So she's heralded as, you know, this incredible mentor, but she also doesn't perform herself. I loved that aspect because, you know, she's out there trying to kind of advocate for Katrina in many ways, even while she's been reviled herself. And then Lantran is 
both filling the role of a mother and a commander. And as an alien, she obviously is not, not fitting in with the humans, so she's been othered in that way. So there are times with interactions with, with humans that she just doesn't quite understand what to do or how to react, and I felt like that was so fitting. So I think, I think all three characters were fabulous. Um, I think that the storytelling of this I can't really tell you how it goes. It more or less follows the the cycle of Shizuka Satomi and Katrina as she's building her up to try and become this this violin um, concerto type type uh, specialist, and she just wants to play video game music. Really, she she loves the violin. She has a passion for it, and she wants to express that rather than necessarily. Um, understanding all of the technical requirements of it and I'm wanting to do it in in that kind of more traditional way and that's something that other people connect with her on and so I think that is what's the heart of this it's this kind of artisanship uh, I would say about making things and, and loving the way you make things and that's expressed in another way through the donuts as well where Lantron has, has kind of come up with um, a way of like cloning the donuts basically <laughs> um, that they sell and they, they don't sell well and she doesn't understand it and then one of her crew starts hand making them with all of this love and care and it really makes a huge difference and she can see that but she doesn't understand it. So I think the passion behind artistry and the care that you put into what you make is really gotten across in an effective way here. So I don't want to spend all day talking about this, but I did really love this. Um, I think there were a couple of, you know, minor quibbles. As I said, the misgendering thing really was the, the main one, but like it, it was not a huge element. It just seemed like it was hammered at really, really hard in the book. So I could have done without that. Um, but everything else was a really inventive story. It was inventive in how it got across the different sci-fi and fantasy elements and the weights that it mixed those. So I just enjoyed this one so very much. And then I have two memoirs that I absolutely loved. They were perfect. I mean, flawless, flawless memoirs. So the very first one is from uh, Alan Cumming, who I've read from before in his memoir, uh, Not My Father's Son was his previous one. And this is his brand new one that just came out and that's Baggage. So hopefully see that there without the glare. Uh, so Alan Cumming is um, a, a comedic um, musical <laughs> uh, actor who is extremely bombastic and very open about being um, not gay, but LGBT. Uh, I don't actually know how he identifies it. It's pretty clear that I think Pan is, is the most likely identification for him. Uh, but he used a different term and I can't remember what it was. It, it was not like a standard term, but it was like a great descriptor and I really wish I could remember what he said. Uh, however, in the previous book, it was very much about familial relationships. And in this memoir, it's so focused on romantic relationships and work and the ways that that has interacted with his mental health throughout his life. So I just, I loved everything about this. Um, I loved the way that this memoir and the other memoir that I read are both signposted very much with legalization of gay marriage. And I think that's that's key because it really tied it together with what's going on in the world. As well, it tied together with his experience of 9-11 and having an apartment in New York as that was happening. Um, the impacts of major world events um, both in the U.S. and the U.K., where he's from, and being um, kind of this this person who is from abroad, uh, representing in the U.S. in in many ways, um, where he comes from in the world, um, being a big fish in a small pond, I would say, kind of the ways that he grew up in that, the ways he didn't fit in with his family and got out. I think we're just so powerful. So that analogs very well with the other memoir that I read. And that was probably my favorite thing that I've read this year. Um, I, I audiobooked both of these, in fact, and I have to tell you, you must audiobook both of these. So so this one was uh, 
Nanette or 10 Steps to Nanette by Hannah Gatsby. And I, I have no words for this. Um, so it's, it's stunning. <laughs> um, as I said, it's probably my favorite thing that I've read this entire year. Uh, it, as with the previous, gives a, a whole life memoir. It starts from childhood and really works up to adulthood. Um, it gives the experience of living in Tasmania, this very small, small area, and effectively a village that was extremely homophobic. Um, and not even knowing that was an option as she was kind of growing up and, and figuring herself out. And she has since done a major stand-up special of the same name of Nanette and talked about her relationship with her gender and her sexuality and that neither of the, the kind of terms that she would use really totally fit, um, which is very much how I feel. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so hard to get across exactly what I want to say because this is, it's so powerful and I feel so connected with her in every way. She's autistic as well. And she talks about that more in uh, her follow-up special, Douglas. And so I have a major connection there. Um, I feel every bit <laughs> the same way she does about, about gender and kind of sexuality and, and the limiting ways that the world uses that. So I think one of the things I didn't realize until I rewatched Nanette after having listened to the audiobook here, and again, so you must do the audiobook for this, because not only is she fabulously funny and has a wonderful delivery, this also does have clips of the stand-up special in the audiobook, so it's really important to have that. But until I actually rewatched it after I had read this, I didn't realize that the title, Ten Steps to Nanette, is extremely literal. So almost the entire book here is giving you context for and expanded versions of the stories that are told in a very bite-sized few minutes in the stand-up special. So you're getting all of the things in her childhood that led up to her feelings about like things like homosexual marriage. and. Um, her, her feelings about the ways that sexual harassment or assault affected her. So you're getting all of that and then getting the actual stories that she told. Um, you're getting the history of how she got into art history because art history is a huge element of her stand-up special. Um, so I think, as I said, it's a very literal take that I didn't actually realize. It's not totally called out that 10 Steps to Nanette means this is the expanded version that she condensed down into her stand-up special, really. So I would say you must, must do that. If you're going to read this, pick the audiobook, and then watch the stand-up special. If you haven't seen it, oh my gosh, I don't know how to sell it to you because it's, it's amazing. Um, it's like a comedy special, a TED talk, and uh, an informative assault. <laughs> um, it's, it's really confronting emotionally about who we are and, and kind of how we address the world, um, the ways that people with power and people without power interact in the world. Uh, it's, it's just so incredibly powerful. So it's emotionally moving and for me, as I said, I, I feel such a strong connection to her. There was one line in this that I'm going to like hopefully hold on to forever. And it's something like I have a whole universe of things inside of me that, that make up who I am. And not a single one of them is gendered, not one. And that doesn't mean that it's wrong for you to have things about yourself that are gendered. That's not, that's not what the point is. But the point is that I feel that way as well. Like I don't feel the connection with gendered elements. And I think more people do feel that way that aren't willing to admit it, that are just going along with, you know, the ways that society has, has pushed them to feel about their gender or has put a gender on them. And that's always been the way I felt as well. And so, so I connected so hard with that line. It was like, wow, that's the, the exact crystalline exploration of, of, you know, how I feel, um, about not feeling a gender, not feeling a connection with it in the same way that most other people seem to. And 
yeah, that's gonna really stick with me. So highly recommend, please check out both 10 Steps to Nanette and Baggage because they were, they're absolute five star memoirs for me for both of them. Um, I think in terms of the, the like political stuff, she does focus on Australia and Tasmania and the legalization of gay marriage there, which was something I knew nothing about whatsoever. And so that was really powerful to hear how different it was and how in so many ways it was very similar to what was happening in the US. Um, and the conflicts that were happening were really, really incredible um, to hear about and, and horrible at the same time. So I think that's it for what I finished. <laughs> it's, it's more than enough um, in terms of what I have in progress. So I almost, I almost am finished with The Last Quintista. Uh, this is, this is um, very interesting and kind of, kind of dark for a kid's book, actually. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure how it's going to wrap up. So uh, I have, I've been really struggling with actually reading. And actually, so I forgot to mention on audio. I, I audio and print book this, and I have to mention that Light from Uncommon Stars, the audio is very weird. It's not bad, but it's weird because the narrator whispers through the whole thing. So I don't know what that is about, but be aware if you don't like whispering or if you are very pro ASMR, I'm, I'm not, it doesn't work on me. Um, it, it, be aware going into this that the audiobook is whispering the whole way through. Um, the other one that I have is Book Two Prize, and that is Where You Come From by Sasha Stanishik. Uh, I'm two thirds of the way through this, so I have to get this done this weekend. I have one more, and fortunately, I found out it's actually shorter than I expected, and it's just a um, like a novella, it's 150 ish pages, so um, that's Inseparable by Simone de Beauvoir. Um, so those are everything I'm doing. The two book two prize books I absolutely have to finish um, in the next week before I start anything else at all. So <laughs> as far as my week stuff, honestly, I don't have anything really major to share on my part. Um, I do, I do want to mention my, my neighbor. Um, so my front door faces out toward my neighbor's garage. So this is, this is the neighbor that's immediately directly next to me. Um, my neighbor uh, lady had a fall a couple weeks ago and um, I didn't really want to mention anything because uh, it was, it was, she was in the ICU and everything. So it was literally a situation of, of her husband came over and got me because she had fallen and couldn't get up. And so we were trying to help her and um, literally every time we tried to sit her up, she was in a lot of pain, couldn't lift her arms, that sort of thing. So it turned out she had broken her neck. And so that was very, very scary. And she had surgery the next day. Fortunately, she's out of the ICU and now is in a rehab facility, um, had like surgery on her neck, obviously, to repair that. Um, but yeah, really scary. And they had to get her, you know, obviously to, to the ER very quickly to get that taken care of. But she was really adamant she did not want to go. So I was very worried we were not going to actually get her, get her out of the house. And she, she would not have been able to stay there because she couldn't get around. She couldn't even sit up. So, so I'm glad she's doing better, thankfully. Um, that was really scary. But now he has COVID. So um, that seems to be going around with everyone I know across BookTube. Several of my other neighbors in the area and friends also have it. So, so be on the lookout, please wear your masks um, and be safe out there because we do not need it really spreading around again. It seems like it's just all over the place um, and people are getting it from, from events and stuff. Um, so so be beware <laughs> for sure. Take care of yourselves. I don't want more people getting sick. Um, I think that's the main thing life-wise. Otherwise, um, heat has been unbearable. Uh, it's just been weeks of over 95 and into the hundreds here. So we're looking like this week it's finally gonna take a turn down after tomorrow. So tomorrow it's gonna be 98. Um, but it's still gonna be very hot and humid. We're supposed to get storms, which means it's gonna be like a swamp here probably. So I'm hoping it will come down. And Cinnamon, my, my dog, uh, finally had a haircut. So he is feeling much better, even though it's really terribly hot today. Um, I got back from the gym today and just have had no energy to do anything. It's been several hours and I finally was just like, I have to, I have to film if I'm going to talk about these books 
because I didn't really want to. I just wanted to laze around. Um, in terms of uh, what I've been doing with my with my lazing time, I have been watching a really fun show on Netflix. It's as some people are coming calling it a K drama. I don't think that's right. <laughs> so K dramas are usually like our are, are dramas, a eh? and are more contemporary. So this is actually fantasy. Um, it's called Alchemy of Souls. So if you liked Shadow and Bone, I think you probably would like Alchemy of Souls. It is following like there's this whole magic where there's kind of potential for soul swapping or soul stealing, and it's like this shadow magic. It's kind of evil. Um, but we're following this, this big sorceress who was on the run and being chased and had to swap souls with someone. And so she ended up in the body of this very average woman who, um, I think turns out to be blind, but now that the soul swap, she's not actually blind, whatever. Um, but then she, the, this woman gets into the service of someone related to the sorcerers who were hunting her her like evil sorceress self and he is desperate to be trained and so now he wants her to train him because <laughs> he's found out she has magic um yeah but it's it's such a good mix because it has high drama in that way um it's got this evil magic and really really good like visual effects i would say for the most part um and then it also has korean comedy it's very like cheesy it's kind of slapstick so it has that as well, and it's got a little bit of romance. So it's a really nice balance, and it's very compelling to watch. So I'm only a few episodes, I think I'm four episodes in. And I'm just really enjoying it. Um, and then obviously I watched Nanette, as I said. So that, I think, was pretty much it. Um, I know the new season of Blown Away just started. If you have been around at all, you know I love like competition, friendly competition shows where they, they make things, where they're skilled at things. So not just cooking shows, but um, Glow Up is another one where they're doing artistic stuff. So I like that kind of competition show versus the, the dumb competition shows where they're just beating on each other, <laughs> being dumb. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that's what I've been watching for the most part this week. I did have a a power outage this week as well actually which was really wild because obviously it's very hot so the temperature was going up really fast i think they are treating all power outages as like an emergency because of the heat here and so it was alarming how fast it went up it went up like 15 degrees in two hours and fortunately i was only out for like two and a half hours and um they got it back up and running but like cinnamon was wilting he was so miserable so we really did commiserate with the people in the uk who were dealing without air conditioning uh it was it was rough so i hope you all are dealing with cooler temperatures now hopefully and uh not having to uh, sweat it all off because that was miserable so i think that's it for me today thank you all so very much for watching doing out there, Mr. Squirrel? So I am legit obsessed with this stuff. Um, they have this at Target, at least at mine. Um, they previously just had like a regular cheese dip, but they just got this spicy white cheese dip. And it's uh, mostly cauliflower, which shocked me because <laughs> I tried it before looking at the ingredients. Uh, cauliflower, cashew, and almond. Um, and then it has like nutritional yeast and uh, lots of chilies and jalapenos. It's maybe a little watery, I would say, but oh man, it tastes great. Or is maybe a strange guy. He got himself under the blanket. You're just hanging out? Just chilling? Like a bro? Just a couple bros. 
hanging out, having a nap. So my Luna pink hibiscus is blooming, and you can see this one's more cup-shaped a bit. And that's compared to these guys, which are a little more like wide open. These are the Holy Grail hibiscus. Blooming like crazy! So cinnamon is about three weeks overdue for a haircut. It's ridiculously hot, and this is just too much. But we got stuck on the waiting list because they're overbooked. Poor, poor Cinnamon. So he's finally going in tomorrow for a haircut. So you'll see, he'll be a brand new dog. Cinnamon is recuperating from a long and tiring day at the groomer. So tired. So tired, huh? Yeah, what a good boy. As per usual, <laughs> It's 100 degrees out, and Coco wants to roll in the dirt, on the hot ground. You are the dirt cat. Coco, <laughs> look at your face, buddy. Hey, hey, can I see that face? <laughs> can I pull on me? Hey, look over here. Yeah, what did you do? What have you done? <laughs> Goof oh? Goofy cat. <laughs> oh dear, my dirt cat. <laughs> Her face is covered. Your face is covered in dirt. <laughs> uh.